very <laughs> excited about today's presentation. What have you got for us today, Tom? Um, well, I thought since, um, yeah, yeah, excuse me, I need to uh, mute this over here. I thought that at least since um, we're going to be doing a series of these, we sort of start with the preliminaries of, because we're going to delve into a lot of very interesting realms of thought, um, different perspectives and paradigms. You know, most people, they've got like one paradigm, and that's it. And you know, it might be based on some experience, might be you know, just based on their general knowledge and lack thereof of anything outside of that. We're all, we're all like that, myself included. I'm not, you know, trying to, um, you know, denigrate the way people think. I'm saying that there's more to ways to think. So I thought what we would start with today is actually you don't, you how don't to have think. To, you don't have to be too nice. We, we're mostly Americans <laughs> watching this. So we know the deal. <laughs> You're a gentleman. We understand, though. It's okay. Yeah, right. So I thought, well, how to think. It's, um, it, well, some people might question my ability to, but that's, you know, the skeptics and stuff, but that's okay. Um, I actually enjoy the, uh, the banter of discussion. But I think there is a fundamental process of thought, um, and it comes from the old liberal arts, uh, which liberal used to mean free. It didn't mean left wing or anything like that. Um, words are so misused these days. In the liberal arts, it was in two branches. One was called the trivium, and the other was called the quadrivium. And now the, the trivium, here's a book on the trivium, liberal arts of logic, grammar, and rhetoric. And um, I will get we'll get to this in a second. I'll describe them. And the second one is called the quadrivium: numbered geometry, music, heaven. Now I'll describe those in detail. But I thought at first I would explain how they fit in and what the purpose is. So let me um, get my screen share thing going here. I'm and very excited. I'm very excited. This all this knowledge, the trivium and the quadrivium, is is now occulted. Yeah. But back in the day, it was standard fare, right? Right. Well, I realized because I mean, I went to good prep schools and things like that. I came out of a highly educated family, college professor, emeritus father. Um, I realized I got some of this stuff, and I was generally being groomed, um, you know, for high end. You know, I was going to be like president of IT and T or something like that. Um, you know, my godfather was like vice president of First National Bank of Chicago, things like that. I, you know, head of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago was one of my dad's students. Um, uh -oh. So I came out of that side. Of course, I dropped out of school. I didn't put up with any of it. But I realize now in retrospect that I was actually learning these things in fragments. Um, so here we see a picture of uh, Pythagoras. And um, here's the famous uh, Pythagorean theorem you know, the uh, three, four, five triangle, which, see, this is actually a symbol of, like, the mystery schools because you can't really solve it through simple addition or subtraction. You have to understand the nature of roots. Could you make and that or, uh, window bigger? Just click the maximize button just so, you know, we can all maybe see it a little bigger there. Okay, does that work? Uh, it's, it's all right. It's, it's, as big as it my, it's as big as it gets on my screen. Okay, no this problem. This is from... Uh, this is from Manley Hall's book, uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages, uh, a brilliant book. Manley um, Hall know, also we, bought books from you, right? You were in correspondence. Uh, he did. He, he, <laughs> he did. He sent me a check, and I cashed it and sent him a bunch <laughs> of books. Um, and I've got a lot of Manley Hall books, a lot of respect for his work. Um, but here with Pythagoras, without going too in detail because there's so much there, and we just want to stay focused here, the 3-4-5 triangle is – the symbol. So what we're going to look at here is, here's the tr we see on the left here, three, four, five. The five is the five sentences. That's a, the hypotenuse. The three is the trivium, which is grammar. You know, it's knowledge. Who, what, where. It's how we define um, objective reality. And um, of course, this whole thing to get about grammar Nazis because nobody knows how to use, you know, there or there or <laughs> any of these things. And I mean, for somebody like myself as a proofreader, I can just I read it and understand it. But a lot of people they they struggle. Those that know it. So grammar is breaking down, and I think that's intentional through the educational process um, because 
the powers that be don't want people to think. You know, I believe we're all being, you know, groomed just to be, you know, slaves. The classless society that most people don't notice because uh, they think they're free. As Goethe said, none are most more hopelessly enslaved than those that falsely believe they are free. God bless here, America. <laughs> and the rest of the world's like that too. <laughs> Although America does have a particular sort of um, degeneration in thought lines because of the massive propaganda through the electronic media. Uh, but anyway, let's get back to here. Uh, we can go on forever about that. Let's stick with the knowledge. You know, so grammar, knowledge, who, what, where, when, building blocks to discerning facts of reality. Um, we have lot logic, understanding the why, you know, establishing valid relationships between facts. You know, so the work of logic is proof. Now, see what happens in like the modern education system and in modern thought. And people say, well, education system that teaches you what to think, not how to think. And the way they do that is they put logic before grammar. So when a person is using their grammar or their language to discern the building blocks of reality, they're already predisposed to reject or alter the input because their false logic has been put to the fore. And fundamentally, that's the problem with modern thought, is everybody puts their logic first. It's like, man, I go, yeah, look, man, like, planes, like, if plane hit a building, it would like crack up and fall down and the building wouldn't turn to powder. And they go, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. It's like, yeah, but what about the facts? Oh, you just want to believe that stuff, right? It's like you, you can't actually have a rational discussion with people. Whether I'm right or wrong, you can't discuss it. They pigeonhole you with um, sort of like hypnotic uh, words like conspiracy theorist, which – you know, creates a cognitive dissonance in their mind and shuts off discursive functions. Um, and, th and this is the reason why, is because this is instilled through the educational process where the logic comes before the grammar. So if you go properly, you have grammar, you discern what's out in reality. Then you have your logic. You know, you just figure out what's really happening with things. You know, things that don't match, you know, you toss them out. You don't toss them out before before you just can actually work that out. Um, that's why I always say keep an open mind until all the facts are in. You know, that's a true skeptic, uh, unlike the so-called modern skeptic religion that knee jerks against anything that doesn't fit the status quo. Um, the the pseudo skeptics that think they're so smart. But then the third one of the trivium is rhetoric, wisdom, the application of knowledge and understanding, the how of a subject. Like now, I'm using my rhetoric to explain my understanding of how this operates. And if we look at this diagram, so we see the trivium, that's the three of the three, four, five triangle. The four is a quadrivium, which we'll get into in a second, and the five is the senses. And see, this is the, this is the thing, is through the ancient mystery school processes, you know, um, the initiatory processes, everything comes through the five senses. Um, and the five senses, as you know, we find through, like, you know, the Gertian approach to, um, you know, gaining knowledge of reality, um, the five senses can give us quite a bit, it can give us everything we need to know. You know, we don't, you know, modern science relies on um, meter readings, you know, what Ernst Lairs calls the one-eyed colorblind approach. You know, if you, if you can't weigh it or measure it, you know, if, you know, only the inert processes. So anyway, th that's that, the three, four, five, th this is the key to everything. If you want to, like, move forward in a true initiatory process and gain true cosmic orientation for your soul as you pass through this earth plane existence, This will you'll get a lot out of this one. So here we see what's the quadrivium. Okay, we know, right, the uh, trivium, right, it's the grammar, but what's the grammar describing? Okay, so we have mathematics, which is basically abstract numbers. Um, I dealt with that a bit in my um, video, Quaternity. Um, so it's, then we have geometry, which is numbers in space, which fundamentally, you know, starts out with the platonic solids, which are, you know, the only um, equal-sided polyhedra available. There's only five of them. You can't, it's the basic nature of space. And the golden section, you know, the, that's like the metric of space, we could call it. You know, any, anything that's alert or alive, and, you know, as we discussed in the past on man or matter, the inertness versus alertness, Anything that's alert or alive functions 
according to Fibonacci series or sacred geometry, you know, depending on various characteristics of its um, internal structure. All right, now we have music, which is numbers in time. Um, so what's interesting is numbers in space and numbers in time. So we have numbers in space like geometry that um, you can take the platonic solids, you know, one of the solids, each, you know, they nest into each other perfectly. You know, geometric forms can fit together with no space in between, right? It fills space when you using it for that purpose. Numbers doesn't work that way, right? Which kind of comes up, you have these two types of tuning, you know, the uh, just intonation and equal temperament, and um, which gives rise to what they call a Pythagorean comma, which is sort of the difference between them. And I believe we're going to have um, the wonderful, brilliant Michael Thoreau with us at some point, and uh, he's a master musician and geometer and understands these things, and we can get the technical definitions from him of this. Right now, we're just trying to get an overview of everything. So it's interesting. Numbers in space fit together. Numbers in time, there's kind of gaps. They function differently. So space and time are actually different things. It's not this goofy space-time that uh, Einstein came up with as a mathematical aberration to explain away a lot of um, what was happening in the real natural sciences. Um, but anyway, see, so we combine them, right? And that's where we get astronomy. Numbers in space and time, which is our observation of the motions of the universe and our relations to them. And this is more, again, just numbers. You know, as we spoke um, in the last one about um, uh, the cosmological botany, you know, where the, you, know, plant, you know, Ernst Michael Kranich's book, Planetary Influences Upon Plants, that is, um, you know, really where the, the higher order functions come from. That's what I'm, I was saying that, you know, the, if you really want to orient yourself in mystery school and gain higher knowledge, you're not going to get it through smashing atoms and protons and at higher and higher speeds looking for some god particle. You know, it's like crazy stuff, you know. I mean, it's kind of cool, and it would be fun to play with that stuff. Um, but, you know, there's a lot better ways to spend billions of dollars. Um, yeah, okay, so those are – there. let's see, I have probably a couple pictures. Let's flip through here. I have uh, – all right, so here's the platonic solids which are attributed to, you know, the ancient elements as formative processes. Um, let's see what else I have here. It, and we see, um, you know, this is Kepler's Music of the Spheres. I can't remember what's all on here, so um, I'll pop back on here. And um, Yeah, so anyway, you see I'm sitting in front of my library here, so at least as we discuss these things, I'm not an expert in anything. I'm like the librarian. You know, I know where the information's at because of the fortunate opportunities of my life has been to meet many amazing people at researching many diverse subjects and with, um, you know, people from old, like, mystery school teachers to, um, you know, hard-nosed scientists, and I just talk to all of them and see what they think. So... Uh, is yes, my good friend uh, Mike Westcott, who uh, plays musician, plays under Terra Nine and uh, serious music label uh, band names, but he calls me the Akashic Librarian because he always says, "Yes, from anything I can come up with it," but doesn't mean I know everything about it. So I don't want—I'm not putting myself off as any sort of expert or anything. It's just that um, I feel like I found some orientation in reality, and that's really what I'm trying to pass on to people. You know, people have to discern for themselves what's happening out there. So um, let me see what else we can bring up here. Um, and of course, so then we start getting out, and one of the things that I want to um, bring up, and we'll discuss a bit of this, is light and color, because this really gets down to, um, looking for the right picture we'll start with. Okay. I always love it when computers sit there and don't do what you click on them for. So we'll have to wait a second here till, um, it's no problem. My screen just, oh, here we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, we all need new gear to do this. So what I'm going to do here is pull this picture, which probably everybody is familiar with. Um, that's as big as it goes here. It's full screen. And now this is like a standard, okay, this is Encyclopedia Britannica. You can't get any more authoritative than that, can you? This picture is absolutely incorrect. 
um, so you see white light coming into the prism, and you see the color breaking. Could you zoom in on that picture a little bit uh, with the controls and the windows? Oh, or, let me uh, see if I can. Oh, no, it wants to zoom. Um, ah, here, zoom. I had to get a new viewer because um, yeah, I had to switch to another computer because my other one was going silly, and we had to come online. So I'm just sort of limping along, putting out here what I can. Okay, so here we see it, right? White sunlight comes in. This shows the light breaking off here, but this is absolutely incorrect. And this is probably why I say people's logic comes before their grammar. So, and this is intentional. There's no way in the world that they're going to put the you know something like this in Encyclopedia Britannica unless they want to put the wrong information and in, and distort your way of thinking. So that's really um, important why, to consider. Why is that wrong? Yeah. Why is it wrong? Well, we'll show you in a second. I'll, let me go to uh, Goethe's pictures. Well, the color doesn't come in here. Basically, you get two color bands. You get red, yellow, blue, violet. The green doesn't appear till out here. There's white in between. Um, so let me find this other picture here. We'll go with this one and see if we can. And now my controls for... <laughs> I was trying to zoom. It won't let me zoom. Um, anyway, just having a bit of fun with the old program. Oh, I think I can probably do it from down here. Let's see. Let me see if I can. Uh, anyway, it's going to go funny on me right now. But as we can see, here's where the color comes from in a prism. This is from Goethe's work, you know, who he believed Newton until he picked up a prism and looked through it. And this stuff's all easily found in uh, image searches on the internet. Um, so here we see the white light coming through the prism. The colors are manufactured at the fringes. The green doesn't appear till afterwards. So, you know, how in the world do we get Encyclopedia Britannica showing us the wrong picture when this is actually what's happening? And here's the interesting thing about this is, okay, so we see this coming through. This isn't light being broken into colors. This is light and darkness manufacturing colors at the fringes. Because if we reverse this situation here, reverse the fringes, let's see, we, go, we get this here, which is the reverse spectrum. And that's, um, you know, what can I say? How come the Encyclopedia Britannica doesn't show you that one? It's obvious that there's a inverse function going on there between magenta and green. And now according to uh, Goethe, green and magenta were like po a secondary polarity in the spectrum. So the primary polarity is the red, yellow, blue, violet poles, which appear no matter what. They're always there. You can see them if you look through a prism, you know, white wall, you see, like Goethe did, you see, you know, the fringes. You might think of it as a lensing effect or something, but that's actually the primary effect is these little color fringes, and they're just um, amplified when done like this. So somehow I'm going to have to close this window to get to another one because uh, it just closed all windows. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to have to close my image windows for a moment and reopen them. Um, anyway, I'll put myself back on here for a second while I'm uh, doing that. Yeah, cool. So let's see. Um, oh, you got. Go ahead. Put that. Put your picture up. There we go. There's um, Dinshaw spectrochrome, and it also works with the Gertian optics. And that is, um, here we see the the red and yellow over on the left, and the blue and violet over on the right. The green's at the top, the magenta's at the bottom. And um, that is basically how it works. I was just looking here for... Um, so the green, the green and magenta are uh, opposite poles of each other. And green, and green is combined, is created when uh, yellow and blue combine, correct? Correct. Exactly. Yeah, green's a secondary color, magenta's a secondary color. And now uh, we've done some work with the old uh, Dinsha uh, spectrochrome system. And what we found, you know, because he had five glass slides, 
It was interesting. Five slides were red, yellow, green, blue, violet. And out of those five slides, you can make 12 colors. Let me see if I can get up um, get one of my pictures on this. The five slides were red, yellow, green, and violet. And from those five, he made 12. So that's interesting because if you, if you look at it and you think that red, yellow, blue, and violet, or, or those four could make somehow make 12, but no. That's interesting. It's very interesting. That's no, it's interesting. Nice. Yeah, to make the 12, this is a, this is a real mystery. See, because the spectrum that, um, what's the name, uh, Goethe came up with, and I'll put this picture up here. Here's another sort of image of it, if you want to put mine up there for a second, and I was just looking for some others. Um, Okay, still got your picture up there. I was just looking for more Dinsha. Oh, hi, there's you. You can't see the, uh, your picture should be. Yeah, no, I see you. You only see me, huh? okay. Oh, now I see, okay, that, now I see my picture. Uh, I didn't realize I had that controller. That's okay. Um, yeah, apologies to uh, anybody that thinks we're like clowning around here because we're just figuring this out, but it's fun. We'll, we'll get more <laughs> slick and smooth as time rolls on. So here we have, um, this is a diagram I've made out of it, but that was only because I was actually trying to get this other picture here, and I've got multiple screens and everything here, and this is a new setup for me here. Here we go. Here's the Dinsha Spectrochrome. Um, and what I'll try to do is blow this up and see if we, um, you don't know why my, um, uh, this new program I put on to open up pictures hasn't been the most, um, easy to use. It's all sudden, it was working fine and all of a sudden all the uh, controls disappeared. It's gone full screen. I can't figure out how to get out of it and have the uh, controls. But let me try again one more time here. I'm sure we can get it here. So I was trying to show the front of the equipment. Uh, yeah, I have that picture up actually on the screen, the front of the spectrochrome right now with the uh, oh, good. violet yep. and green now. Yeah, that, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, see, so what we can actually see is there's actually five slides in there. Um, I believe it was red and green on the front. It was a very clever little setup. So you have, um, you know, you read green violet triangle and then you have your blue yellow magenta triangle um, didn't I mistakenly called the red green violet triangle a triangle of light because it's actually the triangle of darkness the other one is the triangle of light yeah there, yeah that's one another way to look at it um, so here, here's the interesting bit when I first got onto this I didn't really know anything about this stuff um, you know I thought I was looking at things. I'd come across people like Schauberger and Wilhelm Reich and, you know, studying Kabbalah and all these different things, but I didn't know about, like, Goethe and Dinsha and this whole sort of line of thought. You yeah, know, how did you like, discover the spectrochrome? That's an interesting story. Because everyone has a story about how they discovered spectrochrome. Okay, well, I was um, running Borderlands, and you know, I took over from Riley Crabb, and I was just following his procedures and... Um, you know, every every year is a nonprofit, so we had to put out a little profit and loss statement. So we did the um, I put out profit and loss statement. I don't know what it ever took in twenty thousand. It wasn't much, but anyway, I put profit zero. And um, yeah, it was well, it was interesting because I I had actually gotten um, so it came in the mail. I got the three volume spectrochromometry encyclopedia in the mail from uh, this guy Sarosh Gadiali, who's is what Dinshaw's son. I didn't know at the time. I I had heard through a friend about uh, Darius's, you know, let there be light. You know, just using the colored gels the way they did, manufacturing 12 colored gels from multiple, um, you know, like Roscoline gels. And um, I mean, I kind of knew about, it, but there's a lot of other color healing systems, so I didn't think of it as anything absolute. It was just another cool system. Um, but then I got the spectrochromometry, and I started. Looking through that, so I ran something in Borderlands. I think it was in the same issue that had the um, st the uh, financial statement, the first one I put in from you know the end of Riley's year. And um, 
I just said, oh yeah, well here's these two guys. Here's uh, you know two of Din Shah's sons putting out the work still there. You know, as I did when anything ever anything came in, I just give people a link and go. You know, had mail links in those days. You know, we didn't have these click links. Um, so anyway, I get a phone call a couple weeks later, and it's uh, Sarosh, um, who called himself Nick, right? Because he said he needed a nickname, so we just called him Nick. Um, but anyway, Sarosh was. Um, he goes, look. He says your profit and loss statements incorrect. You. Um, he says if it. You can't have a profit zero. He said, you should have it as a loss. I said, yeah, look, I don't know how to do this stuff. He goes, well, I'm an accountant. Do you need help? I said, yeah, yeah, sure. So anyway, so, and, he, and they start telling me, he goes, oh, he said, will you, he said, would you please not mix my work with my brother's work? Um, and I said, well, why is that? He said, well, because my father was very strict about the way the system had to operate. He said, and there was like, you know, occult principles behind it. And that, you know, basically this you know, the, like the let there be light system of Darius was basically not what the old man was doing. So I started reading deeply into it, and I had a dream that uh, old Dinshaw was, um, you know, basically explaining how the circle worked to me, how the five slides made 12 colors. And I realized at that time, this was back about 1986, and it just dawned on me that this was actually the, inner secret teachings of Zoroastrianism that he had somehow stumbled across but because he still put his logic first he still he still believed in the Newtonian spectrum and that everything came out of light and when I started writing stuff on um, Goethe and Dinshaw I remember that uh, Nick would call me up and go oh my father would be all mad I go yeah but he's not here I said if he was here I'd ask him I said the whole point is is we're trying to figure this out and I still can't understand how Dinsha um, went along with Newton because he was working with prisms and everything for so long. So that is a big puzzle in my mind still. But nonetheless, Goethe and Dinsha's system agree perfectly. They are fundamentally the same system. Now to the slides. So you have the five slides, red, yellow, green, blue, violet. Um, so red and yellow make orange. And you don't really get as like the orange you might see in pigment, these are basically radiant colors, so you don't really notice too much of a change, but they would notice a change in the effect on the body in their research. And spectrochrome was used by many doctors in hospitals till the AMA forced them to um, stop doing it. Um, so anyway, you know, like yellow and green make lemon, you know, green and... Um, magenta, I'm sorry, green and blue, turquoise, on wrong, but now to make these other, to, to make magenta, you had to mix the uh, red and violet slides together. And actually to tune the glass, because these were all tuned glass, around 360 degree circles, so they were all spectroscopically tuned, but uh, Nick showed me how to tune them anyway um, by holding them up, and basically the green had to match the yellow and blue together, obviously there and then there was ways to match the green and magenta you could sort of see things on it um, but the fact that the one that the spectrum in the light side is um, does seem to be the dominant one which is why everybody's been confused that um, because we're in physical reality and that is the physical side and the spiritual side is more hidden so this is the unfolding of the light ether into reality and the way that it makes these five colors I mean, sorry, the five slides make 12 colors, I would say, is one of the secrets of the ether, which cannot be fully explained in words. It more needs to be sort of experienced and meditated on. And that's why um, we're, I've been working with um, Mark Fisher and uh, hoping that, you know, we can actually get some units out with tuned glass. There's a few different things out there. There's a lot of color healing out there. And, um, you know, but everybody's still basing it on sort of Newton. And even now, the whole chakra system, you find almost anything on the chakras. They got the rainbow. and But that's not like the authentic system. That's just what people lay on it. And it looks real pretty because the rainbow is all real pretty. <laughs> but like... <laughs> um, but, I want people to... I just want people to understand why we're talking about spectrochrome. Just, you know, a little history. Could you give us a little history about spectrochrome and like how potent it really is, how effective it really is, what it can do? Oh, 
Sure. Well, the spectrochrome system was basically done by Dinsha as a color healing system. Um, no, du no drugs, no diagnosis, no manipulation, no surgery. You know, he said when uh, somebody, you know, you get to that point in life when doctor, lawyer, priest alike, you know, doth fail to bring the required relief. He says, come to me and I'll help you to help yourself. And this whole thing was with the color. I think people kind of look at it as a color healing system because that's sort of the Western discursive mind would think of that. Um, I've instantly recognized it as an initiatory process. Um, and because of that, because it is a true cosmic initiatory process, health benefits are going to come out of it because you're aligning yourself with like the you know true energies of the cosmos, the true natural sort of harmonious structure. Um, but yes, it was used in hospitals. Um, you know, there's contention back and forth, but there is a lot of um, what we would call uh, case histories. I've got here up on the shelf, which I can't reach from here, but we've got, um, I got a spectrochrome magazine going back to the 20s, all bound. And then after the, uh, somebody mysteriously burned down his lab during his, one of his trials and he lost, he had a permanent injunction against spectrochrome, so he changed the name of the magazine to the Visible Spectrum Researcher. So hold and on a second. They they burned down his lab while they sued him in court, and then they issued a permanent federal injunction against the spectrochrome that's last to this day. <laughs> exactly. In fact, it put such fear into him because Sarosh was like the youngest, I think, of seven sons. Um, he was still so in fear that he would never use the name. I mean, I would talk about spectrochrome openly in Borderlands, he was like flipping out. He's going, oh, oh. He goes, oh yeah, FDA, they're going to get you, blah, blah, blah. I go, yeah, whatever, man. I want to see them try to enforce this like 1947 thing. I can talk about it. I don't really care. Yes, um, we can talk about it. Too. You know, because that stuff, that stuff only applied to federal areas. I was living in a state. Um, most people didn't understand that stuff either because their logic, you know, they were taught what to think rather than how to think and never actually penetrated the legal structure of things, which is a whole other story we won't get into today. But it is interesting because now Dinsha went through a couple trials. There was some guy, I think it was up in Oregon, that it was actually a shill. They had him buy the equipment and then make a complaint. So he got dragged before the courts and that. And um, so he had scientists and medical doctors came in to back him up, and he won, right, in a jury trial. It was obvious that the thing was working, and everybody was actually bought it, loved it. And the guy that was um, the paid shill that got it just to put in a false complaint, basically made, was made to look like an idiot. Uh, they tried to do him on immigration because he was, um, he was basically, you know, he's from India, you know, with, you know, some Indian, but he was basically, he's he he Parsi, you know, he's from basically of Iranian or Persian extraction, which is where I believe that, you know, he had this inner sort of knowledge probably from past incarnations, because he's obviously an adept master you know, of this whole Zoroastrian structure. But nonetheless, because he put on his immigration, he put Caucasian, right? So years later, they dig that up because they're trying to do anything. I mean, they did him, they tried to do him for rape because he crossed like state line in a in a, ra a rail car, right? He was traveling somewhere with the secretary. And, and since she was under 21 or something and the door was closed on their rail car, right? That was like statutory rape. So they tried to do him on that. He actually got presidential pardon for that one. Um, but it just shows that these forces against him were very powerful. And um, so anyway, they did this one trial. They seized his equipment. And he ended up in a federal court in New York. And he walks in, you know, to um, stand in appropriate persona and act for himself. And he first started, he goes, oh, so this is an admiralty. And the judge is going, why do you say that? He says, well, because you seized my equipment, right? I'm going, man, this guy was like so ahead of the time. This is 47. You know, people are still like, still trying to catch on to this one today. Anyway, he he defended himself quite well, you know, against like experts from General Electric, Kodak, you know, the prosecution brought in like, you know, all the heavy hitters. And then Shaw was just sort of like swatting them like flies. Uh, so his book, Thousand Years Ahead, which is out of print, I've got a copy here. It's supposed to be a few volumes. Only the first volume uh, was printed, you know, because of the fire and stuff. But anyway, in the middle of that, he was obviously winning. So his lab got firebombed, and it was such an incredible fire that it destroyed everything. I mean, it melted the equipment. It was so, it was perfect arson to destroy everything. 
and he had nothing. So they ruled against him because he had no evidence, right? And that's when the permanent injunction came in. Then John also testified in Congress against the FDA. He said, "Look, this is just like the you know the branch of like the medical mafia is going to use to stop anything that's not like poisoning people with you know pharmaceutical drugs. It's a scam." And he was their first target, you know. So um, yeah. So you figure if they went that hard against the guy, there's probably something there. And now the system was complex. He had to do it at certain times. You know, he put out like these uh, rhythm charts depending on where the moon was and how your nostrils were breathing. So like I say, it was more intense, but I used it on various things. I remember um, a young girl playing uh, with my stepdaughter years ago, and they are goofing around the bushes up in um, you know, the forest of Northern California, and girl poked herself in the eye and had uh, she was bleeding under her eye with a cut. And she actually had really bad eyes. She had lazy eyes, and her mouth was having these, like, bacteria injections in it was supposed to do something to the muscles, you know, whatever. But lovely little girl. Um, so anyway, I thought, well, what can we do? Um, you know, it was like late afternoon. Here she was, um, a little cut under eye. It wasn't really bad, but I just knew that her mom would freak out when she came to pick her up, you know, because she's so concerned about the eyes. So um, I put her under, uh, you know, I can't remember, I think it was blue or violet light. We said, hey, look, we got a magic box that'll heal it. And we... Um, but, but the girls, the, the two girls sat there and played under the thing while it was on for about two hours. And then the mother came to pick her girl up and um, said, oh, yeah, yeah, she poked herself in the eye. We went, oh, God. And we go and look, and you couldn't even see. There was, like, nothing there. And we were, like, amazed. I didn't expect it to actually work that well, but it certainly did. And I, another time, um, we actually got really bad sunburned. I was down at the beach with my friend Vince Gaddis, the uh, wonderful old researcher who discovered and coined the term for the name Bermuda Triangle. And uh, I rescued Vince from a nursing home. He lived with us for about eight years in Northern California. But we went down. He didn't like the beach. <laughs> he goes, I don't know what you'd like the beach for. But anyway, I took him down there one day. He liked drinking beer. So we were just sitting down at the beach drinking beer, talking about stuff. And um, I took him home. And I didn't realize I, got, I was really badly sunburned. And um, to the point of pain, I mean, it was really bad. So anyway, I put the uh, Dinch uh, box on, you know, violet. I think I did indigo, right, because that was like the painkiller and stuff. And I actually fell asleep with it. And I woke up early in the morning, going, oh, and like, I was scared to move because I was so burned. I was thinking, oh, God. And I got up and I started moving around. I was going, wow, the burn's gone, right? Neutralize it out because according to the Dinch theory, right, there's too much red in the system that absorbed out of sunlight, which, you know, so it was like an acute. So acute system, acute conditions you treat with the blue side, you know, like systems you have like, you know, cancers and things in the body that would be, and of course we're just talking research and reference here, you know, I don't want anybody to rely on this because um, everybody's got different situations. But if it's a long-standing condition, then you use sort of the hot side to speed things up. And there was always a process. You always started with like green intonation to, balance the system. Then you might move to like yellow on the intestines on the stomach area to clear the intestines and it does actually work. Um, was, so Mark, Mark told me a story about how he relieved constipation by on his son just by shining a yellow light on his stomach. It worked great. That does work. No, it's amazing. The thing does work. And see color is color. And color will work and I say there's a lot I've got a couple shelves of color healing books um, off to the side here. You only see a few of the books behind me here. Um, you know, maybe we'll get like a little movable camera someday, go around and show more of these things. I just can't have them stacked up next to me. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. The thing is, color is color, and there's a lot of systems that actually work. But the thing about Dinsha is he's called the automatic precision. It was the only color healing system that contained the pure archetype of the light ether, and it's unfolding into manifestation. And matches perfectly with Goethe's higher knowledge of um, prismatic experiments. Just so people so, understand, Dinshaw did 20 years of research before he officially unveiled this system, correct? Oh, definitely. Yeah, you know, he worked with it in India and then the States, and um, he was no slouch. He, he was in all kinds of um, things. He invented like a flickerless um, you know, movie projector, movie system, all kinds of things. But like I say, all that stuff was destroyed, you know, in the firebomb, literally. So, so he was a contemporary of Nikola Tesla, and they came down on him 
in a very similar way. Yeah, even worse. I mean, Tesla is sort of like, um, you know, because Tesla stuff is so far out. Yeah, he wasn't a threat because, you know, it's kind of hard to build a thing to power the world. You know, you need big funding and all that, and Tesla was never really that good in that sort of sense. Um, Dinshaw was a direct threat because doctors were using this stuff in hospitals and, you know, they used them in burn units to get, you know, skin was regenerating. You know, you don't need, like, skin grafts. You burn your arm, you know, second, third degree burns on your arm. You don't have to, like, skin graft off your leg and stuff and make scars all over. And you, they were just, like, treating it with, like, coconut oil and blue light and regenerating skin. Did you talk about um, that? Okay, every in the 50s, they say, like, almost every clinic in America had a spectrochrome, and people would walk in with massive first-degree burns, and they just shine blue light on them an hour a day for 30 days, and they'd have a fresh new uh, just layer of pink skin. No skin grafts, nothing. Did that actually happen? I don't know if it was in every clinic, but yeah, definitely I've seen it, like I say, I've seen it work myself from severe sunburn, which was actually second degree. You know, it wasn't even first degree, man. I'd like really just want to pay attention. Um, so, you know, like I said, different. I mean, I put sunscreen on Vince. I was worried about him because he was never in the sun, but I never didn't put any on me. And I was just silly enough to sit there for hours in the hot sun. And um, yeah, yeah, that just like, I would say, just probably five or six hours sleeping under the thing, and um, it pretty much was gone. Uh, startling. Now, the thing with the Dinshaw system is he had yet to do it certain times, um, and there probably are times like cosmic tidal times where it will work better. And he even, like, he couldn't do it during eclipses. And I can't remember all the reasoning. Um, you know, I really read through this stuff like uh, 25 years ago, but um, yeah, I didn't really practice it and remember all the details. I was just trying, you know, for me, I just go through this information, and to me, I'm sort of like, you know, I, I throw a a book in the hopper in the sieve and just shake it and see what sort of, um, after I sift out all the sand, I see what sort of like structural archetypes are there. And that's all I really remember from these different processes is the structural archetypes. I, I can't really remember all the exact details of every system that I've been through. You know, my, my brain's not that big, um, which is always nice to have a lot of people around there doing different things. Then you can ask them. Um, so, but definitely it worked. But they were, like I say, by the 50s, it was um, pretty much banned, right? He was still selling them. He was selling them into the 60s under the visible spectrum, but it was really 20s, 30s, and 40s was the heyday of those. Um, and people are probably still using them. I had a couple which I trusted people look out for me, but they sort of disappeared, so I don't um, have them anymore. But I do have a set of the tuned glass. And like I say, Mark has been working with the... Um, analysis of the glass. And this is one of the things we discovered in the glass. And we'll get the graphs together when we have Mark on here and we'll show him that green and magenta do have the same wavelength, but they rotate in opposite directions in the ether, as Dinshaw said. This is fascinating. Um, and we just discovered this by chance, the way that the spectro spectrometers work that you know, Mark went to some high-tech lab to doing it. And um, I'm going to let him explain that when we get on, but we are going to show this. And also, too, that like, um, you know, purple and turquoise and uh, scarlet and um, lemon, respectively, have the same wavelength peaks. We're on one, let's say, so magenta, right, because you got the two colors that come up. Um, let me see if I can actually find one of these graphs here while we're having a chat. So this is an important um, point, just just shining the color blue and trying to combine it with uh, violet that you just pick out is really not going to replicate the system. It has to be the exact wavelengths, and they, when they combine, it's going to produce an exact, another exact color. So it's very precise. Exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, yeah, so anyway, we get the peak. I'm, I'm opening up this like a spreadsheet, so I'll see if I can get the, if it'll open and get the graph up on this old computer here. Um, it should be opening here. Um, oh. Yeah, well, you, when we get the peak, I can't remember, it was about 528. Uh, but on the magenta, we yeah, okay, here we go. Here's the graph coming up. It's just... Um, we keep going back to spectrochrome because it literally is a secret to understanding the structure of the ether 
through light and color. I mean that I want people to understand that like we're 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 going at this thing because th this is it right here. This symbol is ancient, you know. We're we're not Jewish. It is not about any religion. It's just about this ancient system for understanding the construction of the ether through light and color, correct? Exactly. Exactly right. It's actually the heart chakra. It's and that's why the See, always, I struggled for years, you know, for actually decades. I couldn't figure out why, because if you look at like the Chortons or the Stupas, as they call them, um, you know, which is, you know, like the sacred buildings in India of the elements, you know, it's like earth and just the logical progression of the elements, earth, water, air, fire. But in the chakras, fire is below air, right? The Manipura, you know, down below the solar plexus is below the heart, which is air. And I, like I say, I really, really struggled with this for years until I finally realized, right, that the light ether actually is the gateway to the unfolding of everything. So naturally, in the organic system, the, uh, the fire is is below that to activate the body. Um, let's see. I was just okay. I got my magenta graph here. Not that one. Okay, if you want to put that up. Um, and I'll see if I can find the green graph. Now, when Mark was actually looking at this, he asked them, I've, I haven't found it here because um, I've got stuff spread across a few computers. But he actually said, can you turn this thing down and can we see below here? And we actually turned it down. It's like logarithmic. But you can see that the, um, the trough of that, of the tuned glass is identical to the peak of the green. So I'm looking for the green one here. If I even have them all in here. Yeah, we weren't planning on really talking about spectral chrome day, so I have to. Um, yeah, have it's, this is a pretty deep topic. I think it needs its own show. I'm actually. Yeah. I actually have a question for you about the uh, trivium and about grammar. Because when when I think grammar, I think you know. What kind of apostrophe do you put after or before the S's on plural words, and where do you put the semicolon and stuff? But I think there's a slightly different <laughs> uh, denotation when you talk about the trivium and grammar, correct? Oh, uh, no. Well, I think there's kind of grammar um, is, um, well, no, that's it. And it's different in different languages. You know, I mean, I studied, not that I got very good at it, but I studied Mandarin and I uh, studied Spanish. And what you find is when you, start learning a different language is you actually think differently, right? You can still think about the same things, but, you know, the um, there's actually sort of different perspectives inherent in the different languages. Um, so, yeah, grammar is just basically the functional code that you use for, you know, transmitting knowledge of things you observe, you know, things that are out in space and time. Um, yeah, so, and that's the thing, yeah, with using your apostrophes correctly, you know, that's so that you can transmit the knowledge easily, and not that English is the greatest language for doing that, but it's not really all that bad either. It does work to a certain extent. Um, yeah, I was just looking to see if I had some other, um, I had some other graphs here on this, and let's see if we can, I know that's on that one. Try to get all my windows up here. Uh -huh, here we go. I'll just get to the right picture before I pull it up. Okay, since we're on there, I'll show some of these sort of pictures here. Here's my mouse. And we'll get the... Uh, Screen share. Okay, right. Art of understanding, right? Um, as Aristotle said, the aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inward significance. And the reason I'm bringing this in is because when we're talking about spectrochrome and, and dinsha and we're showing these like etheric symbols and stuff, I, I believe these are, are the true keys to um, any sort of science that would move forward in the higher realms. You know, it's not to say we discard all the materialistic sort of science that, um, you know, the big machines everybody's built to play with. 
those mimetic concepts suspended, right? You know, everybody thinks what they've been told. So, you, you know, mind must be willing to accept reality as it is directly experienced, not as it is currently taught to be construed or believed. So you abolish, reconstruct, and use belief systems to gain higher knowledge. So that's what I did, like, at Borderlands, when I was working with all these different inventors and philosophers and thinkers, is, you know, look, look at the difference between, like, you know, Tesla and Philo Farnsworth, you know, sort of completely different worldviews in the way that they um, developed their technologies. And all, everybody I talked to, right, everybody had, everybody had their worldview. We've discussed this before, you know, and, say, and people that get into these alternative subjects and sort of start waking up, it's almost like they take the first clue to, to waking up becomes sort of like their filter, their new belief system. So what I was able to do in order to be the ultimate diplomat and get along with everybody, I tried to understand their belief system and be empathetic with them and understanding so that I could understand the core of their knowledge and what they were trying to transmit. And then I started realizing that uh, I was fully capable of having different belief systems. For example, you know, the old heliocentric belief system that everybody believes that the Earth is going around the sun, right? They believe it. Um, and there's reasons for believing it, but nobody's ever experienced it. Um, whereas, like, let's say the uh, geocentric or the uh, anthropocentric more properly is um, everybody experiences it, but they no longer believe it. Um, so I thought, well, I'll start combining the different belief systems. And I, start, I realized that there, then that there was four archetypal belief systems that I went into. Um, and that's what I meant here by abolishing, reconstructing, and using belief systems to gain higher knowledge. And, um, and learn to use ideations gained from processing experience as a theory of higher knowledge. And that's what um, Steiner and Goethe were into. And Steiner tried to bring that forward. You know, he said that imag imagination is an organ with which we can create new organs of cognition. So, for example, understanding Goethe's theory of colors is actually an organ of cognition because people think that the Newtonian theory of color is correct, and that's their organ of cognition, and that's why they just so happily accept things like the rainbow chakras. You know, I mean, I've seen these brilliant like expositions on the chakras, videos people made, but they're still using the rainbow colors. I'm going, man, that's not, like, not a true initiatory process. It's a distortion. And... Um, you know, maybe I'm hard-nosed. I want to see the stuff um, actually, you know, that's for me. I'm passing through. I want to know the real stuff. I don't care what other people say or believe. I want to know what the truth is, right? As my old mentor, Riley Crabb, used to say, he said, to search for truth wherever it may lead. You know, he said, make sure. I said, well, I was always trying to be there, so I'll keep on it. <laughs> um, so there's, yeah, the art of understanding. Um, here you go. So the art opinion, of ideation. Yeah, when, go ahead. When we look at uh, any any chart or graph these days that has that has colors, we should always try to keep the Gertian spectrum in mind, with uh, blue and yellow making uh, green and the red and violet making uh, magenta. We should always keep that order in mind. Right, it's a circle. It's a circle of color. Um, it's not a linear thing. In fact, the linear electromagnetic spectrum is a distortion. It's sort of Part of the underlying brainwashing of everybody, which is um, far more pervasive than even most conspiracy thinkers even think, right? This has been so well laid out for centuries underneath everything to prevent people from seeing what's happening. Otherwise, everybody would know what Goethe was, and we'd have to go get a job or something, doing something productive, because everybody would know this stuff, and we wouldn't, nobody would care if we were discussing it except, you know. Um, so, but... Let's say, I would say, is an organ of ideation. So in that sense, yeah, but more so, like, you walk outside and you look up and you see, you know, the sun. You know, so most people think the sun is that, you know, yellow, yellow whitish sort of dot that moves across the sky. But to me, the sun is the blue dome as well. The sun is both because both the transverse and longitudinal components come out of the sun. It's completely different than, so science has construed it, although from their construction they can develop certain sorts of technology which works, but they don't have the true deeper understanding that resonates with the structure of the soul and manifestation. So the initiatory process of the soul is stunted and so much so like in our present day, you know, civilization's initiatory process is stunted. Totally, you know. Yeah. 
more people know who Kim Kim Kardashian is than Nikola Tesla. You know, it's like, man, how did I get on this planet? I can't believe it. So anyway, <laughs> but what is ide ideation? Right, I was talking about that, and that's what like I was talking about. You know, going out and looking at the sun, the sun being both the blue and yellow components, which are the the polarities. So there's polarities in everything. There isn't a straight line through stuff like just a bunch of vibrations. Things have vibrations, but, but they're qualitative expressions of higher forces. So, um, yeah, I said, where's one begin to measure a circle? The circle being, you know, our knowledge of reality. You know, where, where do you actually pop in? And if you have a false belief system and a false logic, sure, you can be in the middle of it and you can argue forever, you know, but you still can't, you, know, and you can make fun of people like the pseudo skeptics do because you don't believe the way they think. But how many people are actually able to process both belief systems? Because I am, you because know, I mean, I came out of one and came into the other, and you know, I I can understand things, and sometimes things don't always work over to one, and I have to go over to the other one to think things out. Uh, because it, and it's that which survives the different belief systems, the archetypal structures, which is the true knowledge of things. Right? See, so true archetypes are axiomatically derived from naturally observed functions or actions. They're not some agreed definition. You know, rather, the symbol activates the sub and superconscious and was originally intuited you know, directly from reality. So I call them, rather than archetypes, I sort of just call them axiomatic derivatives, but then I realized I had to explain it more, so I just call them archetypes. Right. Aesthetic art and code is symbolic logic. This is kind of one of my talks when I get more into the, the art of things. Um, and functional symbols may be derived through becoming aware of primary perceived reality untainted by belief systems or conditioning. And since we are actually tainted by belief systems and conditioning, that's why I propose the multiple belief systems. And this is something we'll actually have to have a separate hangout on what I call my four world theory. Um, and the four, four worlds of the Kabbalah, which is just another symbol, which works in some ways, works in doesn't. But here we see the four worlds at the top here, the world of archetypes. And we have, right, they call it the creative world. You can call it archangelic. That stuff doesn't really matter. I'm, we're just going purely with, they call this astral. I would call this one the, um, the formative. And the bottom one, active or manifest. So, and basically there's a tree of life in each. So you have like the, you know, 40 spheres, and this bottom one is like what they call Malkuth, that's Earth. There's a sort of modern sort of cult Kabbalah and stuff, but again, that stuff really doesn't get into the, the primary functions of things. It's more of a, you know, it uses bits of that to pull people in and, and give them a little bit, and people get a little bit of bliss out of it, you know, the bliss bunny from grabbing one little thing, and that's their thing. Um, and if they still their mind through it and get there, then that's perfect, right? I, I would say I'm not knocking it for me. I had to go through everything. I want. I want to know the absolutes. In fact, it, people disagreed so strongly about these deep systems. Um, right here's where I sort of show them. Like, so here you have the archetypal, creative, formative, and material. It would break down spirit, thought, word and deed, force, pattern, activity, form, fire, air, water, earth, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical. Right. So there. You keep seeing these archetypal forms come through, and here's a way of seeing them, <clears throat> how the Kabbalah more unfolds. Uh, I've used some of these pictures in uh, my Quaternity video, so if people want a bit more of how I think on some of these things, and then we just have different ways of looking at the archetypal structure through plants and clouds. It appears in everything. So, um, yeah, where can we go from there? Well, I was talking about the way people believe in, so we have to get people past the electromagnetic spectrum, right? It's functional to a certain degree, but as we can see, even the Encyclopedia Britannica is putting the wrong spectral pictures in. And uh, like I say, they don't do that stuff by accident. There's no, there's no purpose in that. Why, why, why is that stuff wrong? I don't get it. And why are people so strongly opposed to thinking through these things? You know, because it's funny, and people go, oh, yeah, well, you know, they get into these things. Well, if you don't, um, you know, they start wanting to talk about these hypotheticals. Well, if a tree fell in the forest and nobody heard it, is there a sound? And I go, of course there's sound. I go, well, how do you know? I go, 
<laughs> yeah, they, um, they because just make up new stuff all the time. <laughs> the whole thing is alive. <clears throat> the plants are sentient. They may not have cognitive and motor processes the same as us, but they certainly are reactive to things in the environment. They can see, hear, smell, taste, send out signals. They're in symbiotic relationships with um, you know, mycelium from you know, fungi, with insects. You know, of course there's sound. I mean, but that's what I'm saying is people are so narrowed down and you start challenging the way they think and then they start throwing out silly stuff like that. Then they start calling you names, um, which is funny because yeah, I've been called some names lately for pointing out somebody was wrong on something. So I like what you put on that uh, funny picture you made up that you post on Facebook, right? One of my powers or talents is thick skin. Uh, yeah, you have high hit points because of that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you have to. I've dealt with some crazy people in my life. Some of the most brilliant people I've dealt with that really understood certain aspects of reality were also some of the most like emotionally retarded and uh, <laughs> difficult to deal with. You know, we won't mention any names because we don't want to promote them. But um, <laughs> and, and, and another thing about reality too is you're out there looking at it. You know, as I said, the geocentric, and that gets into the formative world. And um, and that's like the fourth stage of the quadrivium, right? Numbers in time and space, astronomy, or we could call it harmonic analysis. But this gets much deeper. And here is a book here, The Nature of Substance by Rudolf Hauschka. And um, this is actually brilliant. Hauschka was, he founded Walla Pharmaceutical Company. He was one of uh, Steiner's significant students. And he did these experiments um, where he would actually filter out sections of the spectrum on yeast. Because he was studying the vitamins. And basically, yeah, see if I can. Um, he used different things, yeast fermentation, spheres, uh, da, 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 warm flight, chemical action. So he was actually trying to discern the ethers directly through experiment. And that's what I liked about the scientists that worked with Steiner, is they really just got into this stuff. Um, let's see if I can find this little picture here. I should scan this stuff and we can show them up. I need to organize my pictures better because this picture viewer, because Windows Picture Viewer wouldn't open all my things. It kept opening in um, Explorer. So I got this other Irfan view, but now that's actually acting funny and won't give me my controls when I go full screen. I can't get out of them. Um, but anyway, what he did is, and the picture's not becoming apparent here, Hauschka basically filtered out using different things like alum. Oh, here it is. I did find it, and I'll hold it up so people can possibly see it. So alum, iodine, esculin, he was um, basically filtering out different sections, infrared, ultraviolet, invisible. And this book is available through Rudolf Steiner Press. I'm sure you can find it online. Um, I actually showed some of this stuff in a lecture I gave back in 1990, which is on my YouTube channel. Um, I can't remember the name right off. Um, but what he did is, okay, so he, he would do that on yeast, and then the yeast would have different sort of effects, right? Yeah. Dried yeast in the alum sphere with exclusion of, um, yeah, anemic. So basically what he would show is is that what they call avitamosis, right? The diseases you get from lack of vitamins were the exact sort of formative patterns that he would get in these yeasts by filtering out different sections of the spectrum. So his thesis was, and I say he founded well a pharmaceutical company, so I'm wondering like he was just some guy was making this stuff up because he wanted to believe it. He believed that things like ascorbic acid <clears throat> wasn't vitamin C, but that that chemical structure carried the vitality, which was vitamin C, right? Almost like we think of pyramid energy, right? A pyramid to a certain shape, it creates certain energy. Well, in that sense, right, like the ascorbate, ascorbate molecule, because you don't have to do ascorbic acid. You can do like sodium ascorbate or calcium ascorbate. Um, that's... Um, yeah, basically, the vitamin C appears in there because of the structure. 
you know, in the atmosphere, you know, comes into the plant world through, you know, these things were discovered through, you know, basically chemical analysis of okay. plants. So they got them out of there, but then you could reproduce them and carry them on. Of course, from nature, they carry them around. So the point of that is, is that these ethers are basically streaming in. Well, I, I want to... I want to know something here because I've always wondered sure. what vitamins really are. You know, like what are vitamins? Are they, you know, that powder that you buy in the vitamin store? Does that have vitamins? Are they just like building blocks? Or, but it sounds like what this fellow was saying, what Hashka is saying, is that they're actually like etheric vitality and they're carried in certain. Uh, cells or molecules better than others, but it's possible you could buy that molecule from the store, but it would have no real vitality to it at all, and thus you wouldn't get any real vitamins from it, correct? Or You can and you can't. depends on the quality of the vitamins and the source of the material. Um, one of the interesting things that Hauschka did in this experiment, or in this book, was um, they were doing like homeopathic curves with um, you know, because actually after uh, Wohler sort of synthesized uh, urea, right, that was sort of like the death knell to vitalism in chemistry. Well, well, you can make this. So he actually showed, you know, by doing homeopathic dilutions, you can have what they call potency curves where depending on the amount of times that you potentize it, which is not mere dilution as a pseudo-skeptic might attempt to uh, sway you from thinking using that sort of terminology, um, you can actually get different reactions and the different potency curves they have, I mean, just as an example, these are, may not be real numbers, but let's say 8, 16, 24 times you do it or whatever, they'll, they'll have a higher reaction than, you know, maybe like 5, 10, and 15 of the numbers of dilutions. So he took, um, uh, I can't remember which chemical he used, but he, he did tests with this where he would take the natural and the synthetic, potentize them and do potency curve tests, and... The, um, the synthetic molecules had no potency curve. They're just flat-lined, and the other ones had you know, very active curves. And uh, another thing that Hauschka did was um, he showed that, well, going back to experiments of the Baron von Herzola, who did experiments where he was using, like, triple distilled water and uh, you know, basically platinum-sealed, hermetically-sealed sort of jars growing sprout seeds. Um, Hauschka reproduced his experiment, so he would take like a measured you know, weight of seeds, just whatever alfalfa he used, and uh, he would put it in triple distilled water and grow it for three days, you know, sprout it for three days, the same, same thing, and he'd have all kinds of these experiments going, he just didn't do one, he'd have, you know, just keep on rolling them. Um, so it was always standardized measured weights going in. He'd do like mineral analysis uh, before and after of seeds, and he and then he would graph it out, and he would actually show that um, the minerals were basically coming into the plant in triple distilled water in hermetically sealed containers. So where do these minerals come from? They're not coming out of the soil, that's for sure. And then he graphed them out over like a dozen years, and um, you could actually see that the different minerals would like come and go at different seasons. First, uh, his emergence and passing away of phosphorus and potassium during the period from June to December 1939. Right, those are the lunar phases in the, along the line, and then it's the coming and going of the elements up and down. This book's full of all kinds of these, you know, star, his name is Chapter Star Patterns and Earthly Substances. And um, it basically, he finally worked out, I think I can find this picture here because the book's falling apart. It was a poor binding. Oh, it's benzoic acid. That was the, there's the potency curves for the ben, natural and synthetic benzoic acid. The natural one's at the bottom, the synthetic's at the top. Oh, that was distilled. I'm sorry, it was probably this one here. There we go. Benzoic acid, synthetic benzoic acid at the bottom. So they say, you know, people, oh, well, is that reproducible? It's like, well, not everything's reproducible if you don't have the exact same way they do it. You know, just the, the fact, and science is, and I'm sure that these things can if somebody actually went and did them. But there's other parameters have come into play. Um, okay, here we go. The, the oceanic crust. Here's, here's sort of the uh, culmination of Hauschka's work with that. 
Right. So the yeah, acid spaces yeah, come at different times. These are basically the times of year where the different elements would be more dominant in the um, hermetically sealed sprouts. So, you know, that's what I say. I love some of these German scientists. They were just like, <laughs> just yeah. really went th through this stuff in detail. Okay, now what I was saying is, you know, parameters. Can you reproduce these experiments today? Well, certainly you can. Will you get the same results? What well, gets into, like, Lily Kalisko's work with the, um, I'll see if I can find some of her pictures here. We've certainly the got metals, some online. The metals and planetary alignments, yeah, amazing the work. The metals and planetary alignments, exactly. Now, because she was doing um, gold sun, and for people that aren't familiar with this, they've got... Um, I did a very primitive experiment in that vein where I, I was making colloidal silver. I made it before, and it usually turned out very cloudy, and uh, the, the water would taste, have a very kind of uh, poignant taste, not so pleasant. But uh, for the first time a couple of weeks ago, uh, I made it under a full moon, and uh, I made sure the moonlight got in there, and... Uh, the water was clear. There was uh, there was no bad taste at all, but you know there was definitely silver in there. Because when I uh, used it to uh, as, as a nasal douche, it still burned. So it's pretty much finer quality. Yeah, you sort of faded out there and froze for a bit. I'm not sure if uh, that fed yeah. through. The closest person to the quality we did on the full moon than before is that So there's something that's obviously the fact on metal that the analysis will always say. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sound like you're in a fishbowl at the moment, bro. Um, <laughs> um, anyway. Well, I'll say, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I kind of got that, you know, on the full moon it was quite better, but, yeah, we were getting distortion on that. But, like, here's a book that uh, my late wife, Alison Davidson, wrote, Metal Power, Soul Life of the Planets. And this was, she was, a, uh, it's out of print, but posted it online. Um, she was a brilliant astrologer, homeopath, um, herbalist. And um, I remember, because she was always, I was always going on about all this, you know, Steiner's work, Lily Kalisko and Hauschka, she's going, oh, that's all that you know, German male science stuff, you know, got to get into the feminine. I go, hey, look, you're an astrologer. Check this stuff out. Check out Lily Kalisko. And she took a look at it and was so fascinated, she wrote that book, which is a brilliant, brilliant book on um, the relationship between the metals and the planets, you know, gold in the sun, silver in the moon, you know, copper, Venus, Mars, iron, Jupiter, tin, Saturn lead. These are very real. And I posted on the borderlandresearch.com um, Lily Kalisko's book, Spirit and Matter, where she covers you know, more of this and shows a lot of the, her, her actual crystallization charts. But the reason I brought this up, you know, we're talking about the reproduction of experiments, is that um, so she did these experiments and um, hold on, let's pull the books down and show you a few here. You got. Uh, he has like spirit and matter. Uh, what's this? You know, it's about the sun in 1928, or not getting real good. And here's, oh, sorry, this one here. Total eclipse of the sun, gold in the sun, a kind of experiments conducted in connection with. And now these books are just basically little short pamphlets describing, you know, the, the crystallization charts. And you start learning the character of the crystallizations, which are hard to show in just a simple one-off. And there's another one that we'll get these lined up and we can go through more in detail so people can actually see how the different <clears throat> planets affect the metals when they're in sort of like, you know, 15 degree relationships and stuff, you know, multiples of 15, you know, conjunctions, squares, oppositions. These have dramatic effects on the crystallization properties of metals. The thing with these gold in the sun is that Kalisco showed that during solar eclipses, here's one 20th May 47, and the other one was in 28 or 20, yeah, uh, 29 June 27, that when the sun moves, when the moon moves in front of the sun, it distorts the crystallization properties of gold, which 
it's pretty weird. People go, well, maybe it's just gravity. I go, you know, how come it doesn't affect anything else then? Um, you know, and that was like the old Greek concept of the atom. It wasn't this smallest little bit that you could tear off and still, you know, get down to like these little, you know, billiard balls that don't exist underneath everything. That, um, it was that qualitative element that existed both in gold and the sun. Um, so that was the atom. And it was the connection was cut off during the eclipse. And maybe that has something to do with why, you know, Dinshaw didn't want, you weren't supposed to use the spectrochrome during the eclipse. And I, I can't remember the reasoning for that. Maybe Mark will remember that. We can discuss that. But there are certain effects there. Um, but she gave a talk in 1964 called Gold in the Sign of the Times. Um, uh, okay, I just got a little thing from um, Taxami says, re-inviting me. My connection here is minor outage. So anyway, I seem to be still live, so I'll talk and we'll see if we're on or not. Um, because I see he has disappeared. So, Gold in the Sign of the Times was, uh, in 1964, Lily Calisco realized that um, the gold wasn't crystallizing properly anymore since the 1950s, and that there's something had disrupted the connection between Earth and, and Sun. Um, yeah, I'm getting all kinds of Skypes in now. Um, so I'll just keep on. So what was that? Right, I figured it was probably the electrification of the planet. You know, the mass over, you know, ar over the uh, ar you know, ra radar propagation and things, because that's what uh, Trevor Constable in his book, you know, the Cosmic Pulse of Life, which I edited the second edition of. And he discusses uh, when radars, because he's an aviation historian, and is, he discusses when radar first came in, all these radar angels would start appearing. That um, and you know, planes would be scrambled to go check them out, and there'd be nothing there. And eventually, they sort of drifted away. It didn't really happen anymore. Well, I th they could have been what you know the ancients called sylphs, you know, the beings of the air. Um, yeah, you know, maybe the radar killed them off, but definitely the electrification of the atmosphere disrupted the connection between gold and the sun, and that's what Lily Calisco was worried that you know perhaps gold shouldn't be used anymore as a homeopathic medicine for the heart. Um, so <clears throat> whether or not something like Hauschka's experiments are going to be fully reproducible again is a good question, and that's something that you know, would be need to be discerned by experiment. There, there may be people doing these experiments. We haven't come across them. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if um, I'll text and come back online, but I've found some other pictures here. And here's the uh, spectrochrome therapeutic acoustic system, you know, where Dinsha actually tried to tie it in with music structure. I've never really dealt with this too much and it's interesting because now there's a lot of discussion about you know the, the 432 harmonic for or 432 frequency for A being the proper tuning um, you know it was posted on the Ether Force page the other day the sonic geometry or just go to YouTube and search for sonic geometry and watch that and so these are all areas you know we bring these ideas out but this is all about coming out to um, get the information out so people can research and learn. So 